everyone. Um, I hope everyone's week is off to a great start. And I think it probably is if you're tuning in to this awesome conference. So I'm Tiffany. I use she, her, her, she, her, hers pronouns. I live in the Bay Area of California, more specifically in Oakland on occupied Ohlone territory. And I'm a co-director at Real Food Media. I'm thrilled to announce Anna LaPay, best-selling author, advocate for sustainability and justice along the food chain, and an advisor to funders investing in food system transformation. Anna has been awarded a James Beard Leadership Award and was named one of Time's Eco Who's Who. Anna is the founder or co-founder of three organizations, including Small Planet Institute and Real Food Media. So I do get the pleasure of working with Anna daily. Um, what doesn't show up in her bio, but that anyone who works with her knows, is that she is incredibly passionate, generous, and driven, and the food, mov and the food movement is really lucky to have her. So today, Anna is going to talk to us about SPIN, corporate SPIN in the food and agrochemical industry. The food and agrochemical industry spends billions annually to shape the narrative around their products. And it's not just advertising, right? Although that is like perhaps the most visible tactic. Billions go towards influencing policies and regulations so that it favors corporate profit over public and environmental health. In this session, Anna will share some of the research and reporting that she and colleagues have been doing for years that unveils those tactics. So without further ado, Anna. Thanks so much, Tiffany. It is a pleasure to be here. And uh, as Tiffany said, she and I get the pleasure of working with each other. So it's really a delight to be doing this session with her. Uh, I am thrilled to be presenting on this topic today. It's something I think about a lot. And uh, like, like Tiffany, I live in the San Francisco Bay Area on unceded Ohlone land. And we are here in coronavirus lockdown. So please forgive me if I interrupted by uh, my daughters or my dog at some point during this session. Hopefully uh, they will keep their distance. Uh, as Tiffany said, I'm Anna LaPay. And for the past two decades, I've been writing about food the, the food industry, advocating for sustainable food solutions, and more recently working with philanthropic partners to support transformational change for food sovereignty. My connection to food in a way was preordained. I was born in 1973, two years after my mother, Frances Moore LaPay, wrote her seminal book, Diet for a Small Planet, and just after she co-founded the Institute for Food and Development Policy. I was raised to connect the dots between US foreign and environmental policy, labor law, and corporate power with what was on our plates. And I also ate a lot of brown rice and tofu, as you can imagine. 20 years ago, I wrote my first book uh, with my mother, Hope's Edge, sharing stories of social movements around the world, addressing the root causes of hunger, many you've heard from at this very conference. That book set me on a lifelong journey that brings me here with you today. In our time together, as Tiffany said, I want to talk about spin, about ideas. Who holds the power to shape our ideas about how the world works, should work, and can work, and particularly when it comes to food and farming. I hope you will leave this session with a deeper understanding of how food industry shapes our belief systems and in turn the policy regulation and food environments that we all operate in. And I hope that you are inspired to try like me to do something about it, to see the work of uprooting misinformation as another key fight that we are all engaged in. Specifically, I will talk about pesticide industry spin, what it is and how it affects what we see, hear and read about our food system and why it's so important to expose it. I'll wrap up my remarks with lots of time for questions. So please type them into the ask a question section of your screen and uh, Tiffany will tee those up for me uh, when I'm done with my remarks. Uh, so I I've long been fascinated uh, by how the narratives we hold shape everything from who we vote for to what we eat and how those narratives are developed. I've only become more interested in this question and alarmed about where the answers lead in the context of this political moment. As I watched in horror as white supremacist insurrectionists stormed the Capitol on January 6th, I thought again about these two fundamental truths. One, our very human capacity to be swept up in belief systems or narratives, frames of reference, even if they fly in the face of hard evidence. As neuroscientist George Lakoff has reminded us again and again, if facts don't fit our worldviews, we're more likely to ignore them, reject them, attack them, or literally not even hear them than we are to accept them. 
and two, how misinformation can spread even farther and faster in the mainstream media and social media landscape of today. It is with the awareness of these two ideas that I want to explore pesticide industry misinformation. Today, many now well understand how big tobacco and big oil spent decades pushing doubt and denialism about the dangers of their products, leading to millions of preventable deaths and threatening human life as we know it on the planet. What's less well understood is that the chemical industry companies uh, pushing pesticides on communities and farmers around the world have been doing the same thing. For decades, the pesticide industry has been using deceptive communications tactics to drive the narrative about their products in order to control the public debate and shape regulation. The pesticide industry isn't using the playbook of big oil and big tobacco. They helped to write it. The industry deploys this playbook to push the twin narratives that one, pesticides aren't that bad for us, and two, we need agrochemicals to feed the world. To do so, they try to drum up doubt about the scientific evidence, proving the very real threats to human life, ecosystems, and the climate of pesticides and pesticide-dependent agriculture. Now, throughout my remarks today, I'll be using the term pesticides. Many of you know this, but just to say, um, pesticides is the term for that broad category that includes herbicides to kill weeds, fungicides to kill fungi, insecticides to kill insects, and more. So just keep that in mind. It's that broad category. Uh, and in this talk, I will share key pesticide industry spin tactics, moving from the most overt examples, as Tiffany said, you know, the advertising we see all around us, to much more opaque and stealth tactics. And I'll show how these tactics have been working together to really shape the dominant narrative we have about food and farming. As Tiffany said, I've been working on this research with colleagues, uh, including Stacey Malkin at US Right to Know and Kendra Klein and Kari Hammerschlag at Friends of the Earth. Uh, many of the examples that you'll hear today come from a forthcoming report I've been working on with Stacey from US Right to Know. Before diving into the tactics, though, I just want to back up and underscore just why this spin is such a threat. I mean, if you're tuning into this conference, maybe it's something you're likely well aware of, but it bears underscoring two key points. First, the scale of the industry and its growth trajectory, and second, the scope of the industry damage. Uh, so first, the size and growth trajectory of this industry. Uh, in 2019, the agrochemical market worldwide was about $243 billion, and it's projected to grow to as much as $300 billion or more by 2024. As many of you know, many of you work on this all as your day jobs, uh, you know that the industry is highly concentrated. The ETC group just did a great analysis of industry concentration in the agrochemical market and found that four companies now control about 70% of the global agrochemical market. So when you hear me talk about public relations spin, keep in mind it's predominantly driven by just these four companies. And uh, it's an expanding industry. You saw that already in terms of its growth around revenue projections. We've seen these companies increase production and marketing of pesticides, particularly since 1990, as you can see on this chart. And particularly, it's important, I think, to underscore a couple key pesticides that we've seen rapid increase around. And one is glyphosate. Uh, we've seen a huge spike in the use of glyphos glyphosate, particularly you can see that pivot point in the mid 1990s, uh, where you see this growth really taking off. And that's, that's almost entirely because of the introduction of glyphosate resistant genetically modified organisms. So um, what do we know about the damage of these products? What do we know about their impact? At this point, a lot. As many of you know, glyphosate, for example, was determined a probable carcinogen by the International Agency for Research on Cancer of the World Health Organization in 2015. Many of you are probably also well familiar with the massive study on insect populations from 2019 when researchers found alarming declines in insects from around the world. And they were really clear that the driver behind much of this insect loss was due to massive industrial monocultures and agricultural pesticides. In fact, the researchers in that study said, unless we change our ways of producing food, insects as a whole will go down the path of extinction in a few decades. I don't know about all of you, but when I read this report, I was 
so alarmed, uh, already had been so concerned, but even more so reading this study. Now, the human health toll is also really alarming. Last year, researchers determined that a staggering 44% of farmers are poisoned by pesticides every year. And we know, again, from ample evidence from around the world that pesticide exposure has been linked to cancers, asthma, neurodevelopmental disorders like autism and ADHD, neurological diseases like Alzheimer's, and Parkinson's. Exposure is also associated with reproductive disorders like infertility and birth defects, metabolic diseases like obesity and diabetes. And we now know that many pesticides are endocrine disruptors, meaning they can mimic, block, or scramble hormones. Worse, we know that the use of these pesticides is actually counterproductive. Pesticides, we see it time and time again, lead to the inevitable ecological result of resistance, pest resistance, weed resistance to the very pesticides being used. The spread of genetically modified organisms, for instance, designed to resist herbicides, has simply further entrenched a pesticide treadmill as superweeds resistant to glyphosate plague more than 60 million acres of farmland today. So with all of this known, how do these companies continue to operate with impunity? Why do regulators fail to crack down on these companies? Why do so many people around the world still believe those twin narratives that we need pesticides to feed the world and that they are safe? The answer, I believe, can be found in part in the billions spent by the pesticide industry through their pesticide industry public relations playbook, through coordinated advertising, marketing strategies that shape what we hear, see, and read about specific products in the industry more broadly. And ultimately, it's a public relations strategy to sow the seeds of doubt. And it's the same kinds of strategies, again, used by big oil and big tobacco for decades. As this infamous quote from a Reynolds tobacco industry famously put it, doubt is our product since it's the best means of competing with the body of fact that exists in the minds of the general public. And it's also the best means of establishing a controversy. Three of these key doubt and denial messages that are really central to this industry playbook are to, to foment doubt by emphasizing, hey, it's not, it's not our fault, it's not us. And secondly, to try to create the illusion that the science is really on their side. And three, to attack personally the reputations and authority of anyone who dares to criticize the industry. Uh, you can look back, again, this goes back decades, you can look back at, to, at the response that Monsanto crafted to Rachel Carson's seminal 1962 book, Silent Spring, when uh, they not only published and distributed 5,000 copies of a brochure parodying Silent Spring and its concerns about DDT, but also launched specific personal attacks on Rachel Carson herself, again, trying to undermine the public's trust in her as a messenger of truth. So to push these broad messages of doubt and denialism, industry uses a range of tactics. And we think of them as kind of what you see above the surface and then what you don't always see below the surface, but are just as influential. So there's advertising. And yes, you know that's the kind of thing that you and I can see in our magazines or on television or even through promoted ads on Twitter. Um, but there's also then a range of tactics, and I'll walk us through six, that are below the surface, that are these stealth tactics. And again, I pull a lot from the research that US Right to Know has gathered through FOIA requests that they've done, uh, as well as research they've been collecting based on analysis of documents coming out of Monsanto through uh, litigation around Roundup trials. Now, I won't have time to go really deep and into one, any one of these tactics, but I'll take us through each one. I'll say tomorrow I'm offering a workshop that will be more interactive, will go a bit deeper. I know it's, it's currently full, but please do sign up for that because I will be following up with folks who've signed up uh, for other opportunities to go a bit deeper on these tactics. So let, let's go through them. Uh, advertising, again, we've seen it, we all see it, we know what it is, it's paid media. But it's important to stress that advertising is much more than just selling products. It's about fostering a halo of goodness around a brand. And it's also about shaping perception of products and really shaping narrative. So on the left, you can see these classic ads from uh, uh, about for, for DDT. 
uh, and the classic DuPont slogan, better things for better living through chemistry, and a more recent ad from a chemical company from Monsanto that was published in Oprah Magazine a few years ago. I imagine you can't read the tiny print there, but I can read it for you. It is Monsanto saying in its ad copy, quote, because growing enough food for a growing world and doing it in a sustainable way requires a wide range of ideas and resources. That's why we partner with farmers, nonprofits, and many others. It's time for a bigger discussion about food. That ad, as you can see, who is it clearly targeting? Families, moms, it's in Oprah Magazine. It's clearly targeting consumers to, again, create a, uh, foster this narrative about the safety of their products and really the need for them for this sustainable food future. Uh, you can see in this next ad, this is targeted more toward farmers. But again, you see the echo of this narrative that, uh, and this was an ad that appeared in the kind of farm press, uh, that you can see the echoing of this narrative that their products are about sustainability, about feeding a hungry world. Now let's dive below the surface. So the next tactic I wanna first get into is deploying trade associations. And these are industry funded organizations. They're a very powerful tool deployed to shape the story of their sector collectively. Uh, these organizations don't just focus on agrochemicals, but, uh, but they are some of the biggest players in that agrochemical messaging industry. And so we flag them here for you uh, to give you a sense of the scope of their budgets over the past five years. These three trade associations alone spent a billion dollars. Uh, so what do these trade associations do? How are they shaping the narrative? How are they shaping a policy? Uh, just give you a recent example. Some of you were involved with this advocacy and involved with this. Uh, last year, you may have heard uh, that CropLife International announced a new partnership with UNFAO. Now, who is CropLife? Its former name, before it went through this branding process to become CropLife, was the International Group of National Associations of Manufacturers of Agrochemical Products. Now it's known as CropLife. But from its former name, you can hear what it is. It's a, it's a trade group that promotes agrochemical products or pesticides. And at the end of last year, CropLife and UNFAO announced a new partnership. And when they did, the head of the trade group said on its website, quote, I firmly believe CropLife International acts as a thought leader and a catalyst for change in advancing sustainable agriculture innovation, which is central to humanity's ability to achieve the sustainable development goals. Now, more than 350 civil society organizations from 63 countries, including possibly some of you watching right now, signed on to a joint letter condemning this partnership and calling on the FAO to cancel the partnership, citing grave concerns about conflict of interest, not least because CropLife's biggest members make roughly one third of their income from the sales of highly hazardous pesticides, the very pesticides that the FAO has committed to working to ban. Okay, tactic two, um, again, taking you through these really quickly and trying to give you some examples in each one. A common tactic, again, used across these industries, whether you're talking about big oil, big tobacco, or big chemical, is to use front groups or astroturf groups, or to deploy industry-aligned organizations, again, to echo these industry narratives. Uh, what are these groups? What do we mean by these terms? So front groups are organizations that are presented as neutral or serving the public interest that actually serve a company or industry whose funding is often opaque or hidden. So the Center for Food Integrity, for example, by its name, it sounds like it's all about integrity, maybe independence. Again, it is a front group for industry. AstroTurf groups are those seemingly led by grassroots activists or even farmers when actually they're uh, industry public relations construct. And then third, there's a category of allied organizations, groups that aren't necessarily underwritten by corporate dollars, but by foundations who share industry interests. And overall, when we looked at 10 of these groups for the past five, uh, from 2014 to 2018, you can see on this slide, we're talking about $146.6 million just from these 10 groups alone. So let me give you an example, a recent example of astroturfing. Uh, um, and uh, you might be familiar with this example. It comes from the EU. Uh, when the EU was debating a ban on this herbicide glyphosate, 
Monsanto launched this AstroTurf campaign. It was called Freedom to Farm, but it had different names depending on which European country it was run in. There were eight European countries that were targeted with this campaign, uh, including this one you can see here from France. As reported in The Independent, the Freedom to Farm campaign marketed itself as a grassroots led effort by farmers in defense of the herbicide glyphosate. This is again in the face of the World Health Organization determining that glyphosate was a probable cause of cancer. After Greenpeace, The Independent and Le Parisien and others exposed this pro-glyphosate Camp, this pro-glyphosate campaign was actually developed by Monsanto PR firm Red Flag Consulting in coordination with longtime Monsanto agency Fleischmann Hillard. The websites and Twitter feeds were pulled, as you can see here, uh, one of the examples of the Twitter feeds that were pulled. Uh, but I, I bring this up as just one example of a kind of AstroTurf group. Again, it was presented as if it was farmers saying we absolutely need to keep this herbicide on the market, when really it was funded by the industry to try to go up against potential EU regulation. And I just want to stress, uh, as before I move on to the next top next tactic, that the, the reach and influence of these groups cannot be overstated, that they are this industry unto themselves uh, and devoted to spin spinning this pro-industry message. Many of the same front groups also work on behalf of big oil and on the half of the pe pesticide industry. And we know about which groups these companies are working with, not only because of investigative reports like you see here, but also because we have, thanks to litigation, troves and troves of internal documents where Monsanto itself is talking about and naming these third party allies. So let's move on to tactic number three. Uh, another really key tactic is enlisting third parties. So these are academics or professional associations that can echo industry message. And these are taking uh, trusted sources of information for the average person and, and really trying to get them to parrot industry messaging. I'll just give you one example from here in the United States that dietitian colleagues of mine uh, have long mentioned and long talked to me about, which is the industry influence on the professional association of dietitians called the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. So there's about 75,000 dietitian members of this association. Uh, and what dietitian colleagues of mine have long pointed out is that industry is given booths at the Association Expo and other opportunities for industry influence, uh, like a recent virtual farm tour that one of my colleagues went on that was sponsored by Corteva, which is the rebranded Dow DuPont company. And she pointed out that on this virtual farm tour, none of the dietitians were educated about any of the potential risks of pesticides. Again, what were they hearing? Those twin messages, we need pesticides to feed the world and really they are nothing for you or any of your patients to worry about. The Academy also regularly offers free credits. Now these are credits that you need to keep credentialed and keep official membership in the association, but free credits by chemical companies like Bayer. What you see here is an announcement about an upcoming webinar that is being offered to dietitians sponsored by the chemical company Bayer about gene editing. Uh, again, a, a, a practice that the company is pushing and trying to create a narrative around uh, for dietitians to, to take this course uh, my colleagues have also pointed out that because the state associations of this dietitians group don't have the fin many financial resources, they often accept free speakers. And who are those free speakers? They include speakers from companies like Bayer. In November last year, 160 dietitians signed a letter to the Academy raising concerns that the about the Professional Association's magazine, Today's Dietitian, receiving sponsorship from Bayer. As they said in their letter, they were calling on the Academy to stop including advertising quotes from representatives from Monsanto or Syngenta or, or Corteva or CropLife or any of their front groups. Uh, they are still waiting on an answer. Okay, tactic number four uh, is uh, a tactic, again, th these are all common across industries, uh, but it's a tactic to try to influence mainstream media's coverage of the industry. Uh, not only through examples like the two that you see here, which are underwriting content. So this is Politico underwriting a quote unquote debate about pesticides sponsored by Bayer, a big pesticide company, uh, or this example of Corteva, which again is this rebranding of Dow and DuPont, 
sponsoring a page on the BBC Futures website, but also influencing which reporters can be trusted to cover the industry. So to give you an example, uh, Stacey Malkin's colleague at US Right to Know, Carrie Gillum, has had deep personal experience with this. By the time Gillum started working on her book that you see here, Whitewash, the story of a weed killer, cancer and the corruption of science, largely about Monsanto and glyphosate, she had been covering Monsanto's business practices for 20 years, first as a correspondent for Reuters, and then in 2016 as research director of US Right to Know. In newly revealed internal Monsanto documents, we learned that the company had been trying to undermine Gillum's credibility for years. Internal memos show that Monsanto and one of its PR firms, FTI Consulting, developed a campaign to undermine Gillum's work dubbed, quote, unquote, Project Spruce, including, quote, proactively background key glyphosate reporters, influencing the Google search results with paid placement of an existing post about Gillum, and enlisting third-party allies to write negative book reviews about her book, Whitewash. In one October 2015 email, Monsanto's uh, Sam Murphy shared with colleagues an article by Gillum noting, quote, we continue to push back on her editors very strongly every chance we get, and we all hope for the day she gets reassigned. Tactic five, weaponizing the web. So I'm sure many of you are aware that more and more of us are getting our information, getting our news uh, from the internet, uh, from web searches, from social media. And in this context, industry and industry allies have developed more tactics to influence what we're seeing there, designing new ways to reach audiences online, including gaming Google searches. Minutes before this talk, out of curiosity, uh, to see what I could share with all of you, I Googled IARC, again, the WHO agency that determined that glyphosate was a probable human carcinogen. I Googled IARC glyphosate, and note the very first hit in my news feed is not from a independent news source, but from an industry front group, Genetic Literacy Project. To give you an example of how industry influences what we discover about pesticides and, uh, and their products more generally on the web, we know again, thanks to internal emails, uh, that in 2015, Monsanto's Lisa Drake engaged industry ally Kevin Fulta of the University of Florida to help boost the profile of GMOs on the website WebMD which uh, for those of you who don't know, it's considered the most popular source of health information in the United States. From those internal Monsanto documents, you can read the emails between Monsanto executives and Fulta, and you can read Lisa Drake from Monsanto saying, quote, over the past six months, we have worked hard through third parties to insert fresh and current material on WebMD relating to biotechnology, health and safety. Before that effort, she said, the material popping up about the topic dredged up highly negative input from Organic Consumers Association and the anti-GMO critics. While Drake noted that recent press pieces had been placed by third parties, and those had improved the search results, she was seeking the University of Florida's Kevin Fulta to do more. Quote, it's fairly simple process, she said, and asked Fulta to consider, quote, submitting a blog on the safety and health of biotech. Fulta's response, can do, my pleasure. The last tactic I wanna get into is perhaps the most alarming, and it is how industry works to shape the science on which our regulation and policymaking sits. Thanks again to discovery and litigation over Monsanto's Roundup herbicide, there is now ample evidence from internal documents of how industry influenced the science on this herbicide, including studies that shaped the public's understanding of its threat and regulators' policy frameworks. And this is just one example of one body of science around one herbicide, but I raise it to stress that this is the kind of influence that we should be concerned about across a whole range of products, across the whole industry. So again, to just give you one very concrete example, one of the most influential studies about the herbicide was an April 2000 paper published in a journal called Regulatory Toxicology and Pharmacology and co-authored by three allegedly independent scientists. Characterized as a, quote, comprehensive safety evaluation and risk assessment for humans of glyphosate and its use in Monsanto's Roundup product, 
the paper concluded that Roundup herbicides do not pose a health threat to humans. Regulators around the world, including the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, relied on this paper as foundational proof of the safety of glyphosate. But internal documents show the hand that Monsanto played in crafting the paper. In an email the summer before publication, one Monsanto executive named William Hydens wrote to one of the paper's co-authors, Gary Williams. And in that email, Monsanto executive wrote that, this William Haydens wrote, that he had, quote, sprouted several new gray hairs during the writing of this thing. And after the paper was published, Lisa Drake, Monsanto's lead on government affairs, sent out a congratulatory email to her colleagues with the subject line, kudos on publication of Roundup Talks paper. In the email, Drake praised seven of her colleagues for their, quote, hard work over three years of data collection, writing, review, and relationship building with the paper's authors. She singled out another five for their moral and budget support and counsel and advice. She also thanked specific consultants for, quote, helping us pull this thing together through infinite edits and reviews. Now that the paper was published, Drake wrote, the public affairs strategy begins to kick in globally. Referencing this paper years later, Haydens would discuss commissioning a meta study to respond to IARC's ruling, noting that an option for keeping costs down would involve, quote, us doing the writing and authors would just edit and sign their names, so to speak. Recall, that is how we handled Williams, Crows, and Monroe in 2000. Now, to this day, Monsanto has maintained the independence of the paper and its authors. Together, these six PR tactics, the millions and millions spent in advertising and more, shape the water we swim in, the dominant narrative that we need pesticides to feed the world and that they are safe for us, the birds and the bees. But we know the truth, uh, that many pesticides are not safe. They're not safe for us, they're not safe for birds or bugs. They're not safe for the workers who produce them or for the farmers who use them. And what you all know so well, we do not need them to feed the world. As we go out into the world, into our organizations and communities as advocates and as rabble rousers, we need to remember that we are narrative weavers too. We can expose the doubt and denial machine of the chemical industry, as others have done so well when it comes to tobacco and oil. And just as importantly, we can lift up the real stories of the evidence from around the world of the ability to free ourselves from the pesticide treadmill and all its harms and grow abundant food for the world. So as we turn over this session to questions, I'm really eager to hear what questions you all might have. Tiffany will uh, bring them up for me and uh, help us sort through them. I highly recommend uh, you following the work of US Right to Know. You can also follow our work at Real Food Media and uh, you can follow us on Twitter at Real Food Media. You can follow me on Twitter at Anna LePay. And uh, again, you can follow US Right to Know on Twitter. So uh, Tiffany, would love to hear what questions are coming up from folks. And again, one more plug for the workshop tomorrow that will be hopefully much more interactive. And again, please do sign up. It is uh, full to capacity, but we are keeping a wait list and we will follow up with anybody who's signed up for potential uh, further workshops down the future. Okay, what do we got, Tiffany? Um, okay, so there's lots of great questions. <laughs> um, we'll start from the top. So someone is wondering, okay, so why when there's plenty of data showing that pesticide residue um, is accumulating in human tissue, does the issue of residue just never seem to appear to reach headlines in the main media? Mm -hmm. Or if it does, it fails to register as a significant issue for governments to address. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, that and that question was hopefully answered in part by what I shared with you all today. So yes, absolutely. There is incredible research out there that is showing the critical concerns we should all have about pesticide residues. Uh, you know, if you look at that at every child born in the US today, so many of us are actually, children are born with pesticide residues in their blood. Um, what 
we are finding despite this really incredible research that we've seen over these number of decades is again, this really powerful, I would call it a kind of public relations machine that is shaping what we know. I remember a couple of years ago, the Washington Post ran a column about a uh, study coming out of Europe that was really downplaying the concerns consumers should have about pesticide residues on their food. And this was a Washington Post column, you know, you'd think a really kind of credible media source. And, and they presented the findings of this study again, as if it was kind of this credible uh, study that had been done. What they didn't divulge to the readers was that actually the, a number of the co-authors of that study had direct ties to Bayer, again, a chemical company that is has a huge product line in pesticides. So I think we have a real crisis of communication and one that we've seen it when it comes to the, the doubt that's still out there about the drivers behind the climate crisis, the fact that we're still fighting the tobacco industry, we're still seeing 8 million or more uh, people die every year from tobacco use. So, uh, so I hope that when I painted those tactics, that it helped to kind of get at that, in answer to that question, it's that not that the science isn't there, it really, really is, and it is only more so, uh, but that how that science is being interpreted by the media, how that science is being, again, the, the doubt that's being cast about that science is being done by industry and its public relations firms and these front groups. And that's something that we all really need to be fighting against. No, I can't hear you, Tiffany. Oh, I should have mute myself. <laughs> um, <laughs> so another person has a question or they're asking for advice that you have for overcoming caution within large civil society organizations and amongst funders. So many of whom end up allowing industry to keep directing the ag agenda because they don't want to appear to be too edgy. Mm -hmm. um, this is particularly true in the UK around GMOs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that, that's a great question. And one of the things that I really want to stress is that it is a deliberate tactic on behalf of these industry public relations firms and on their kind of communication agents to paint critics as as the crazies, to paint the critics as the kind of flat earth denialists. Like that is that is a tactic that we've seen. Again, it dates back to what did what did the industry do to respond to Rachel Carson and her her science on DDT? It wasn't to kind of debate her in the field of science. It was to say that she was a communist or to you know say that she was this uh, you know un unmarriable uh, uh, angry woman. I mean, they they were they were targeting her character, and that is again what we see. Around around any of us who are raising these concerns, often the response is, oh, you know, you're just being too extreme. Uh, we should all be, um, uh, you know, we're, uh, you know, we, we aren't sort of playing nice with other things we're raising concerns. And what I would say is helpful to you, but I would just say to kind of know that that is a deliberate tactic uh, when you feel it coming at you and to kind of muster up your courage to, to really speak uh, to really speak up against these companies. So for instance, I mentioned uh, that letter that more than 350 civil society organizations wrote to the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization with concern about that crop life partnership on behalf of foundations and kind of from philanthropy. Myself and many other colleagues wrote a similar letter on behalf of the philanthropic community. And we, we um, in so doing, I hope that we kind of showed solidarity with those civil society groups. Uh, and so I think one of the ways that we gather more courage and more force is strength in numbers and not being afraid to speak up and, 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 and not being afraid to be that kind of thorn in the side uh, if we're seeing uh, particularly media institutions that we love, that we trust, that we want to see do the right thing, uh, doing something like becoming a platform for industry. So in my slideshow, I, I showed you that slide of the BBC running this uh, website uh, section called BBC Future, and it's underwritten by Corteva, which is the Dow DuPont new branded company. And so for those of you who uh, are in the UK, you know, speaking up to the BBC, letting those kind of media institutions know that we have grave concerns when we see that kind of industry influence. Nice. 
So um, another question is, uh, how hopeful are you that this will change? Have you heard any stories of success where communities have been able to overcome industry dominance? Um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so that is a great question. And as Tiffany knows, you know, part of what we try to do at Real Food Media is always create what we kind of call our hope sandwich. You know, we wanna deliver the, the analysis of what's wrong, but also offer you a sense of like, it's not all gloom and doom. There is, you know, there, there is, there is a, 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 um, there are solutions, there are strategies. And so a couple of things I would point to. Uh, first is, uh, you know, I think partly what's, important about kind of what I shared with all of you today is to, to be honest about what we're up against, the vast amount of money that we are up against, this kind of vast array of institutions that are being influenced by industry dollars. So, so it's, so to not kind of feel demoralized when we feel like it's hard, it's hard because we are up against massive, massive dollars uh, that are pushing a certain narrative. Uh, but the second thing I would say, and this gives me a lot of hope, is when I look over the course of, you know, I have this vantage point of, of just 20 years, but of course, many of you have many, many more decades of uh, to, to look at, uh, what we can see is some real shift in popular understanding. So, you know, when I started this work 20 years ago, you know, there was, uh, uh, we're just sort of on the cusp of this real sea change in the United States in public awareness about food and sustainability and where our food comes from. And I feel like today the average consumer is much more educated about those things and much more educated about pesticides specifically. I also have seen from the vantage point of funding and uh, kind of both on the private side and on the public side that there is increasingly conversations about big ideas like agroecology on the global scale among uh, development agencies in the global north, among agencies like the Food and Agriculture Organization. And I credit many of you probably who are tuning in right now to have really pushed forward that narrative about the power of agroecology to feed the world without having to rely on these toxic pesticides. But again, I will stress, I am not Pollyanna about this. I mean, we, uh, I mentioned at the top of the talk, my mom, Frances Moore LePay, many of you know her um, and her work, and she and her colleagues for how many decades now? Five decades, 50 years, have been drumming home the message that we do not need industrial agriculture to feed the world, that the root cause of hunger is not a production problem, it's a democracy problem. The fact that she has to keep saying that, that many of you have to keep saying that, it might seem demoralizing, but that is just the work. That is the work we have to do. I was telling my mom the other day when we were talking about this, that, you know, do you think that the executives at Coca-Cola have to apologize to each other at their annual board meeting when they have to defend spending $6 billion a year yet again on advertising Coca-Cola because people still need to hear the message. No, they know the work is repeating these messages, continuing to inform new generations, continuing to inform regulators and elected officials and educators. And so that is that is just the work we have to do. Uh, and I'm not gonna sit here and tell you it's gonna be easy uh, or that, you know, we'll sort of, there, you know, I'm not going to tell you it's easy, but it is the work that we have to do. Great. Um, okay. So another question is why is it that our media and politicians are so so susceptible to these tactics you describe, and are so unwilling to let such obvious manifestations of vested interests dominate their policies and presentations? Mm -hmm. Well, I can speak to this question from the U.S vantage point, but I know this is an international conference. And so I recognize that that answer is going to look different in, in different countries. But I can speak from our perspective, which is uh, this, uh, the perspective of having now it's been m many decades, increasing corporate influence on our elected officials. And so because of the lack of really any progressive campaign finance reform really making its way uh, uh, to uh, kind of the national stage, we have a situation where you have candidates who are beholden to their corporate donors. That is, candidates who haven't haven't sworn those off, they're both beholden to them. It's why I get a lot of hope from this kind of new movement of elected officials that are denouncing big dollars from corporate donors and are running successful campaigns on small donor dollars. So the leaders like we have in the US, 
uh, that are part of kind of this group called the Justice Democrats. They're folks you may have heard of outside of the US like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, but they're elected officials who are able to speak freely because they are not beholden to big uh, dollar donors. We see what can happen when the alternative is the case. And that's certainly what we saw in the Trump administration. So just to give you one example that many of you might be familiar with, uh, uh, for, for a long time here in the US and around the world, advocates have been fighting to ban the terrible insecticide chlorpyrifos. So we've known for, for decades really that uh, there is no known safe level for children of this insecticide. It has been banned for domestic use. So for killing cockroaches and bugs in your home, it's been banned because of that concern. And for years, activists were trying and, and public health advocates were trying to get it banned for agricultural uses where it is still widely used in the US. And the EPA was on the brink of passing a phase out of chlorpyrifos when uh, the Trump administration came into power. And it's notable that the, co the company that produces the most chlorpyrifos in the US, Dow Chemical, was a major contributor to that campaign. I think they gave something like a quarter of a million dollars to Trump's inauguration parade. And lo and behold, when that administration takes power, what do you see the EPA do but deny its own science and instead of phasing out and banning that insecticide, they allow it to continue to be sold in the marketplace. So that's just one example of that, where you can see that direct influence. Uh, I will say one more thing on the story of Clopyrifus that goes to your question about where we can derive hope, which is that when advocates saw that happen at the national level, they didn't give up. They kept fighting. And groups that we've been supporting in Hawaii, for instance, continued to push for a Clopyrifus ban there in the state of Hawaii, and were ultimately victorious and passed the first statewide ban of chlorpyrifos. Even though there was this Trump administration, they were able on the state level to pass a ban. So that kind of corporate influence of our elected officials is, I think, a huge part of the story of why we are seeing this disconnect between the real science and policymaking. And it's something, again, where I feel like when I, at the end of my remarks, was talking about how I think we all need to be part of um, reshaping our information landscape. Part of that should and could be figuring out ways to ally ourselves with groups that are pushing for real campaign finance reform so that we have elected officials who don't feel like they have to listen to their corporate donors, but instead can really, really reflect the will of the people. So speaking of corporate influence, um, another person had a question around how much influence um, do these corporations have in our education system and schools and universities? Yes. So uh, I feel like I could give a whole presentation on all of the examples we've seen of curriculum designed for elementary school kids from these companies or, uh, uh, you know, again, webinars or online classes designed for educators to teach about pesticides from the perspective of industry. Uh, but the other thing that we've seen and in this reporting that Stacey Malkin and I have been doing, we talk uh, about is how the industry has really been trying to use academic institutions, you know, it's one of those tactics I mentioned, but use academic institutions to really promote this narrative. And uh, again, I don't mean to kind of complexify everything, but it is all very complex. And part of the reason why they are able to do that has to do with uh, a decades long attack on the public sector uh, by uh, those in power. And I'm speaking again from a US perspective so that universities have less resources. Uh, and so you find more and more universities that have partnerships with you know, companies like Monsanto to underwrite programs or to you know, underwrite the cost of a new um, capital campaign. And that creates all kinds of conflicts of interest. In uh, our reporting that we were doing, we talked a lot about um, the University of Florida, for instance, and about really uh, kind of very out in the open expressions of, of in these internal documents of the University of Florida really looking to see themselves as really helping Monsanto in its messaging. So I think that is um, you know something, again, we all need to be thinking about how do we how do we address that? And I know many of you who are tuning in are part of universities or, or academics and thinking about how can we who are not part of universities support you who are inside to be able to, uh, to have your independence protected. And then also, you know, how can we support you when you're calling on your academic institutions to 
to really distance themselves from what we would consider really as conflicts of interest. So again, another, another area in which there is no shortage of work to be done. And to me, part of, you know, part of the, the path to getting that work done is uh, shining a light on where we're seeing those kinds of relationships. So, you know, they always say sunlight is the best disinfectant, but it's it's really true. It's really important that we're shining the light on where we're seeing that kind of um, that kind of conflict of interest. And and again, thinking about how we can support each other in doing that. So continuing along that same vein of education, um, one person asked, so in, re in many regions, uh, farmers rely on agronomists, agronomists, excuse me, from chemical companies for free advice. Uh, what is the best way to develop other educational networks? And do you have examples of other educational networks? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's a really great question. And again, that's been a huge issue when I talk to farmers here in the US. It's a huge barrier to transitioning. I mean, those of you who are farmers, and I know this conference uh, you know, includes so many people who are actually working on the land, uh, then so many of you farmers know that that transition to go from pesticide dependency to pesticide independence is a transition from kind of input intensive farming to knowledge intensive farming. And that requires a lot of not just one time education, but it requires a lot of ongoing learning and sharing from farmer to farmer. And what we've seen again is a lot of industry influence on those farmer educators. What I have seen from the vantage point of working with a donor collaborative called the Agroecology Fund, which some of you may know tuning in, uh, the Agroecology Fund has been looking at how to resource uh, a lot of these emergent farmer to farmer learning initiatives. So there are these farmer to farmer networks all around the world. Again, I'm assuming many of you tuning in might be part of some that are doing that kind of farmer to farmer organizing so that those kind of knowledge intensive practices can spread. Uh, we're seeing it in, I'm thinking in my mind about, you know, networks that we're funding through the Agroecology Fund and there are networks in every region of the world. So uh, that has been a huge source of hope for me. And when you look at the trajectory of the numbers of farmers engaged, it's exponential. And uh, I, you know, I, I hope only to see more of, you know, more of that kind of farmer to farmer knowledge building just before COVID shut down all travel, all international travel, myself and about 100 other people gathered in Southern India for the Agroecology Fund Learning Exchange. And there were people from all around the world. Um, and we not only were hearing from these groups from around the world, but we also went to learn from farmers who are practicing ecological practices on the ground. And one of the things that I heard again and again from these farmers is that part of how they were able to be so successful was that kind of learning network and was the sharing they were doing from farmer to farmer. So um, it's a critical piece and it's a critical kind of disruptor to the industry having a stranglehold on uh, you know, it, having a stranglehold on kind of the, the practices and techniques that farmers should be adopting. Do you have an idea of what an agroecology spin playbook might look like? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I guess, you know, Tiffany, is that sort of like, you know, what, what would our, uh, you know, what's the alter what's the kind of pro alternative to that spin? I mean, mm -hmm. I'd like to first say that, um, I, you know, would would argue that what we are doing, and I feel like what this whole conference is about is kind of the antithesis of spin, that what we're doing is education. We're doing popular education. Spin to me is when you are unspooling untruths and trying to do it in a way that makes it sound like it is the truth. So uh, our, I would argue, and you know, Tiffany, you can jump in here too, that what we're trying to do isn't spin, it's popular education. So it's, it's again, you know, how do we, through, through again, I feel like talk about David versus Goliath. When you look at those budgets and you think about like the budget of like our tiny team at Real Food Media or the Oxford Real Farming Conference or you know any of these groups that are trying to promote popular education, we obviously cannot compete dollar to dollar, but we are organizers at heart. And so we can compete with uh, sheer, you know, sheer blood, sweat and tears and uh, and can do popular education through things like this conference, uh, through things like at Real Food Media. We've done everything from run an international short films competition to offer a podcast that Tiffany co-hosts to uh, engaging in um, 
uh, engaging in mainstream media through op-ed writing and uh, through through all kinds of other venues to really try to help to, again, not spin, uh, but to be part of this popular education about this narrative that we believe is the truth, that we want people to really understand, which is that we do not need pesticides to feed the world. In fact, continuing a dependency on pesticides will prevent us from actually nourishing the planet, and that the pesticides that are being used today are incredibly harmful, and that we absolutely need to reduce our dependency if we're ever going to uh, be able to confront you know, these triple crises of biodiversity loss, the climate crisis, and diet-related illnesses. So um, we only have a few minutes left. I'll try to get to one or two more questions. Um, so how do we stop agroecology from, be, from becoming subverted by capitalism as it becomes more mainstream? For example, like carbon offsets. Mm. Mm. Uh, I love these questions or like in two minutes, explain. Uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's a really good question and a really complex one. And to me, it's where I think one of the strengths of, of my concept, concept of agroecology uh, comes from, you know, what, why do I feel like that concept is so strong is because it's a concept that holds a uh, inherently in it a conversation about power, and uh, it's about both the science of agroecology, the practice of it, but also the movement building piece. And so, um, you know, how do we prevent it from being co-opted? It's to really make sure that we are not letting that like third leg of the agroecology stool go unnoticed, unresourced, uh, uh, untalked about, uh, that absolutely we have to be talking about power. We have to be talking about what political structures we need to create this world we want. And, and part of that is to have a really honest reckoning with some of these false solutions that could just you know, further cement the control of the very industries that have gotten us into this mess. So for instance, if we only narrowly talk about you know, let's call it, for example, if we only narrowly talk about carbon sequestration in soils as a key climate uh, solution, if we only narrowly talk about that, what is to stop a agribusiness like Cargill from land grabbing, you know, half a million hectares in sub-Saharan Africa and saying they're doing it on behalf of the climate and get all these investors to support them and say it's a solution. We have to talk about holistic systemic solutions that put making sure that farmers are empowered. It's, it, it's food sovereignty, right? It's making sure farmers are empowered to be able to govern the choices over what they're growing, how they're growing it, who controls the land, that we have to make sure that that stays really central into the conversation, or there's there's no stopping it from happening where we have these false solutions that can really move us in the wrong direction and not help us really upend this really concentrated, really concentrated power that's right now concentrated again, just to underscore in the chemical ag sector, we're talking about really four companies that are controlling the lion's share of the market. So we have an incredibly concentrated market. And unless we talk about that, we will not be able to solve, um, again, these very complex problems. Mm -hmm. And that just reminds me of um, like when we're talking about language, right? So like regenerative agriculture, I feel like is, some, is more in danger of being co-opted because it's really just focused on like the practice and the science of the farming as opposed to agroecology, which is so much more than just how we're farming. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and I think, you know, we've talked about this, Tiffany, I've talked about this before, you know, the term agroecology in the U.S. context and to U.S. ears, you know, it, it doesn't have maybe the same resonance that kind of global social movements see it having, but I think that doesn't mean we should give up on it as a term here in the U.S. for precisely that reason, Tiffany, that I think it does have uh, woven into its definition the importance of talking about social movements. Okay, so last question is just what can the consumers do? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Support your local farmers. Uh, mm -hmm. So what can consumers do? Well, I mean, I, I guess I would kind of uh, maybe re, you know, push back a little bit on that question or rephrase it. I mean, this idea of consumer is 
itself an industry concept construct. At the top of my talk, I quoted uh, the kind of father of public relations, Edward Bernays. He was actually the nephew of Sigmund Freud. And he was the person uh, kind of at the cl close to the turn of the last century who coined this term public relations. And he coined it because he had seen the power of propaganda during wartime, during the First World War. And he realized there was incredible, incredible power in propaganda, but he realized that propaganda needed a rebranding and so he started something called the Council on Public Relations which is essentially propaganda during peacetime for companies and he actually created this notion of consumers driven again really influenced by Freud's thinking that these are consumers driven by their unconscious desires and treated consumers as these shoppers, not as the kind of whole people we are. And so I think part of what we can do as consumers is remember that none of us is just a consumer. We are, we're, we're voters, right? We're potentially part of movements. We're part of organizations. We certainly are often, you know, media, we're, um, you know, participants in media. Uh, we support media institutions. So to think about in all those different ways that we operate, how can we be part of pushing this narrative that is so critical right now and that you know we and i speak for tiffany and me and everybody at real media you know that we see as so critical to really creating uh, the world that we know is possible so i'll i'll end with that uh, and turn it back to you tiffany for any last words yeah um thank you so much anna i mean even though i work very closely with you i learned so much um today in this session so there are so many great questions and I wish that we had the time to answer all of them, but unfortunately we do not. So thank you everyone for joining us. Um, and just a reminder that Anna is having a workshop tomorrow. Um, yeah, any last words, Anna? No, just again, thanks for, for coming today and please do connect with us on social media and you can find resources from Real Food Media at realfoodmedia.org. And thank you, Tiffany, for hosting. Yeah, my pleasure, thank you.